our lecture series, which we've named after William Duncan, and every month we do a, a different topic, and it's the first Saturday, or second Saturday of the month, uh, with a, a guest speaker at 1 o'clock. As you can see, if you've walked around the museum here, our collection is growing, and this year, in 2020, we're going to be working right across the hall and doing a really rather large exhibit on our participation in World War II. So we have a lot of artifacts, and there were certainly a lot of people who uh, participated in, in the big war, so to speak. Uh, today, we're going to hear about Blanca Airfield by Elliot Smith. He'll be talking to us, and he will be introduced by Richard Gillis. There he is. I met Elliot about, what, three years ago down at Blanca, and um, I've donated a lot of things to him for Blanca, right? And it's really amazing. If you haven't been down there, you ought to go down there. You only go down open in the summer because there's no heat in that building. It's a great big hangar. So Elliot was raised in Brooklyn, New York, and um, when he was 16, he took his first flying lessons, right? Okay. After receiving an engineering degree from Penn State, he entered the Air Force and served as an airborne electronics officer in the various fighter squadrons. Um, he moved to Dower with his family in 1972 to join the EDL division of McGraw-Hill as director of engineering. In leisure time, he retired in 1998, including flying models, building and sailboat powers. Uh, in, 19, in 2011, he joined the Friends of uh, Blanca Airfield. I almost said a different one. <laughs> so I used to saying uh, Friends of Brainwine Springs. I'm a member there and also, so was he. But he was, he's Friends of Blanca Airfield uh, and a volunteer, became member of the board, served as a term of president. He is, long, he is currently treasurer of the board and member of the board of Delaware Aviation of uh, fame, right? Okay, so I introduce Elliot Smith. You are. Okay, good afternoon, folks. As Dick said, uh, we're going to talk about the uh, Blanca Airfield. The uh, Blanca Aviation Corporation and Airfield was located in Newcastle on Frenchtown Road, which is now Route 273 and uh, Center Point Boulevard. The uh, Blanca factory and taxiways are long gone. <clears throat> but the classic hangar, as shown here, used by air service still remains. I'd like to tell you a little bit about this hangar and the uh, Blanca Airfield. I guess you all recognize this fellow. Uh, Charles A. Lindbergh. A few months <clears throat> After his historic flight on May 20th, 1927, he set out to visit all of the states with the spirit of St. Louis. Charles Lindbergh's Delaware visit was October 21st, 1927. Delaware did not have any commercial full service airports, only a few privately owned airfields with limited facilities, such as the DuPont and Briggs Airfield Biggs Airfield uh, actually is now where the Grace Lawn Cemetery is. But he landed at Henry Balin DuPont's private airfield. And that's Henry standing next to uh, Charles. Thousands came to see him at Henry's airfield. The spirit did not fit in a hangar. Actually, Henry was a little bit embarrassed about that here. He, here we have this famous visitor, and he's got this uh, dumpy little airport. Delaware needed a proper airfield. Henry Balin DuPont had already been in contact with, uh, with Malanca about creating an aviation industry in Delaware. By the end of 1927, Malanca agreed to move his company to Delaware. That's Giuseppe Mario Balanca. He was born in 1886 in Schiaca, Sicily. He was in, had an engineering education and he taught math. He was also interested in aeronautics and designed and built an airplane with some of his friends, 
that, uh, that actually flew, at least one flight. Uh, he moved to Brooklyn in September 1912. He was a brilliant airplane designer. He's in the National uh, Aviation Hall of Fame and was on the cover of Time magazine back on July 4th, 1927. While living with his brother in Brooklyn in 1913, he built a parasol <coughs> monoplane. I call it parasol just because of the fact that the wind is up above the pilot and so on. Uh, unique for the time, it had an engine up front and a rudder and elevator in the back. Uh, he taught himself how to fly and it happened to have a 30 horsepower, three cylinder Anzani engine on it. And of course, that's uh, Blanca standing there by the prop. One of his uh, uh, students who was trying to learn how to fly was uh, Fiorello LaGuardia. And Blanca taught uh, Fiorello LaGuardia how to fly, and uh, he in turn taught Blanca how to drive a Model T Ford. <laughs> Of course, LaGuardia was a bomber pilot in World War I, <coughs> and later, of course, mayor of New York. He made several more and improved parasols and ran a flying school through 1915. And this is one with a policeman in it, so I guess they either bought one or just taught one of their pilots to fly. Unfortunately, none of these planes exist anymore. It would have been nice to actually see one. The closest they come to existing is that in the uh, Balanca Museum at the airfield, why we have a non-flying full-size replica of the original plane. That's, that's quite uh, interesting to see. In 1916, he was hired by the Maryland Press Steel Corporation in Hagerstown, Maryland, as an aeronautical engineer. He built the Model D, which is this one, had a 26-foot wingspan, weighed only 400 pounds, and had a 30-horsepower, three-cylinder Anzani engine. And he used wing warping uh, for airline control. That's where they actually twist the wing a little bit. Nowadays, of course, you have ailerons. A year later, he built the CE. This had a six-cylinder, 90-horsepower Anzani engine on the front. And this one used ailerons that had a cruise speed of 100 miles per hour and would land at 40 miles per hour. And it was very, very maneuverable. Clarence Chamberlain, an experienced and well-known pilot, saw an ad for the CD and ordered one. It took almost a year to get it because the Anzani engine was not available because of the war. And presumably, that's the ad that, that uh, Chamberlain saw. Chamberlain was a barnstormer <coughs> and, <coughs> and used his CE <coughs> for aerobatics at air shows and to give rides. Unfortunately, the plane caught fire when the engine backfired while being started and uh, was destroyed. It was a nice airplane. Chamberlain's got his name on the top. Chamberlain was so impressed with Belonka and the CE that when the Maryland Press Steel Company shut down in 1918, he bought all the existing tools and inventory. But a fuselage still exists. It's owned by the Hagerstown Aviation Museum, and they hope to rebuild it someday. In 1921, Blanca joined the North Platte Aviation Company in Nebraska and finished design of a four-place closed cabin monoplane designated a CF. The company went bankrupt before the CF was completed. Blanca partnered with a motorcycle dealer to form the Roos Blanca Aircraft Company to complete the CF. The CF carried four passengers and a pilot who sat in an open cockpit behind the wing. Can't quite see the cockpit there. But apparently at that time, uh, pilots generally felt that they like to feel the wind on their face, you know. Guess it'll tell them whether they're going up or down. <laughs> it had outstanding flying qualities, 
won many performance and efficiency contests at air shows. The CF and all production rights were sold to the Yellow Cab Company. No additional CFs were manufactured. Eventually, Belanca's son, Augie, acquired it and donated it to the Smithsonian. In 1972, uh, it was restored and is now displayed at the Yudva Hazy Museum. Of course, that's at the museum. It was pretty advanced for its time. It carried four passengers inside the, uh, the fuselage there. And as a, I guess, a publicity uh, gimmick, why they had a marriage ceremony performed in the air with the <laughs> bride and groom and the preacher sitting in the cockpit there. So Blanco was looking for something to do and he had an idea to improve the performance of the de Havilland DH-4B airplane used by the post office. Uh, Balaga guaranteed the post office that he couldn't improve performance. And apparently he said that if he didn't improve it, well, he wouldn't charge him anything. But, <clears throat> but he moved back to New York and formed the Blanca Aircraft Company, and he provided new wings and struts for four of the DH-4s which greatly improved their performance. The, the post office was very happy, but they were unable to order any more mods. Presumably, they just didn't have the money for it. So Blanca, once again, shut down due to lack of work. Blanca was hired by Wright Aeronautical Company to design and build an aircraft to showcase their new 200 horsepower Wright J4 whirlwind engine. The WB-1 was a sixth-place plane that could carry over 1,600 pounds at a speed of 125 miles per hour. The plane, unfortunately, was lost in a landing accident while being tested on the maximum load. At that time, the WB-2 was under construction, and the WB-2 was a four-place aircraft with a welded steel tube fuselage and an improved 220 horsepower J5 whirlwind engine. The WB2 competed in the 1925 air races and beat all other entries for, for its efficiency. The Wright Company, however, decided to get out of the airplane business and concentrate solely on engines. They felt that if they built airplanes that they may not be able to get the business from other airline airplane manufacturers, and they were mainly interested in building engines and selling the engines, uh, so of that. Belanca left right, and with financial backing from Charles A. Levine, formed the Columbia Aircraft Corporation and uh, bought the WB-2 from Wright Company and renamed it Columbia. And of course, you'll hear more about the Columbia. That was a pretty famous airplane. Belanca and Levine felt that the WB-2 could win the New York to Paris or Tag Prize. Uh, they agreed to sell it to Lindbergh, who, who really wanted it, but they would sell it to him only if uh, Belanca and Levine selected the pilots. Well, uh, Lindbergh, of course, uh, he wanted to make a solo flight, and he, he got pretty upset about that, but... Uh, uh, but he, not, he would not accept that condition. And of course, he went on to Ryan to build the Spirit of St. Louis. Blanca fitted extra fuel tanks in the Columbia, and on April 14, 1927, set a world endurance record of 51 and a half hours, piloted by uh, Clarence Chamberlain and Bert Acosta. <coughs> on April on April 24, uh, Levine's daughter, Eloise, christened the Columbia. To celebrate, Chamberlain took Eloise and the, her girlfriend up for a ride. On takeoff, the Columbia lost a wheel. Chamberlain uh, made an amazing landing on one wheel without any damage to the plane. The, uh, the girls thoroughly enjoyed the flight. <laughs> sure.
Her, her, uh, the girl's mother was a little bit upset. <laughs> <laughs> On May 27, both the Spirit and Columbia were ready to go on, on the flight to Paris. But Columbia, however, was locked down in a hangar under a court order due to a contract dispute filed between Levine and co-pilot Lloyd Berto. At 7.54 a.m., Lindbergh took off for Paris. The injunction on Columbia was lifted at 2.30. Malanka ordered the Columbia's fuel to be drained and the trip canceled. Two weeks later, the Columbia flew to Eisleben, Germany, with Levine as the first transatlantic passenger. After Lindbergh took off and uh, they released the Columbia from, uh, from the hangar, uh, Chamberlain told Malanka that, look, it, if I leave right now, I could probably catch up to, uh, to uh, the spirit of St. Louis. Columbia was a, a faster plane, and of course it was already, already fueled. But Balaga uh, told him, no, he says, look, it, we're not going to take off until Lindbergh finishes his flight. So they towed the airplane, Columbia, to the end of the field. This is a, this is a Roosevelt Field in, in Long Island. Drained the fuel and uh, hauled the airplane back to the hangar. Somebody allegedly dropped a cigarette, so all of a sudden there's this big flame, and people at the other end of the field knew that the Columbian had just gone up in flames. Fortunately, it didn't. Levine remained in Europe with the Columbia for several months. He wanted to fly the Columbia back to America with Mabel Bowles, the Queen of Diamonds, who was a woman that he met over in Paris, uh, as the first transatlantic woman passenger. But he could not find a pilot willing to uh, try and attempt to cross the Atlantic at that time of the year. Uh, but the, eventually the Columbia was shipped back to the, to the, to the States. And it continued to set records, including two more transatlantic flights. Unfortunately, the Columbia was destroyed in a hangar fire on January 25, 1934, while awaiting transport to the Smithsonian. And that was right at the uh, Blanca Airfield. It was in a uh, stored in a barn there, and they had a grass fire and uh, it destroyed the barn and across the Columbia, unfortunately. In July 1927, Henry B. DuPont offered Balanca the 360-acre Spring Garden Farm for him to build a factory and airport. By the end of March 1928, the necessary funds were secured to start construction of the airfield. Construction of the factory and airfield proceeded rapidly, and in less than a year, the Blanca airfield became a reality. In addition to the Blanca factory, a hangar was built and leased to Air Service Incorporated as a fixed base operator who provided fuel repairs and flight instruction. The airport at that time did not have any paved runways. It did have uh, probably three three landing strips in different directions, but just grass covered. On October 6, 1928, a grand opening of Balanca Airfield was held. Over 100 military and civilian aircraft flew in. Stunt pilots performed, rides were given, and even the Goodyear blimp flew overhead. Balanca airplanes <laughs> continued to set world records. Miss Vidal was piloted by Clyde Upside Down Pangborn. That tells a little bit about what he did. And Hugh Herndon. They planned to set a new around the world record, but bad weather delayed them so much that they gave up when they reached Siberia. Instead, they decided to try for the $25,000 prize 
offered by a Japanese newspaper for the first nonstop flight across the Pacific. They flew to Tokyo, taking pictures along the way. When they arrived, they were arrested and convicted as spies. After paying several thousand dollars in fines, they were allowed to leave in Miss Vidal. They took off from Sabashiro Beach, dropped the landing gear, and after traveling over 4,500 miles, made a belly landing in Wachee, Washington. 16 months later, one of the wheels they dropped washed up on a beach in Washington. Interesting thing about, about that is they, they decided that if they did not have a landing gear, they could probably get about another 10 or 15 miles per hour speed, which of course would translate into uh, a fuel saving. So they rigged the landing gear with the uh, pins instead of bolts and uh, cables on the pins that they could pull from the, from the cockpit. After they took off from uh, Japan and reached altitude and decided they were going to continue, they pulled the cables, pulled the pins, and most of the wheels dropped. <laughs> One didn't. So they, they were up fairly high altitude, and uh, Pangborn climbed out of the cockpit, stand, stood on a strut, and was able to uh, maneuver the wheels enough so, so they dropped. Because apparently he was in his bare feet, they were up at sub freezing temperature, and it was quite a, quite a task. But they dropped the, dropped the wheels and successfully crossed the Pacific. This airplane is a, is a replica, and I don't know the exact, exact date, but it did visit Delaware and landed at uh, Newcastle Airport uh, a number of years back. Right now it's in a museum in Washington State. The CH-200, that's that airplane, <coughs> was the first plane built in Delaware. Blanca CH pacemaker planes won many trophies. Augie Belanca donated the trophies and all of Belanca's papers to the Smithsonian after Belanca's death. The uh, pacemaker with EDO uh, pontoons were very popular in Alaska and Canada. They were also flown with skis and there are a number of these planes still flying. Amelia Earhart was interested in the pacemaker and had several demonstration flights with Eleanor Smith, an experienced pacemaker pilot. Eleanor did not think that Amelia was competent enough as a pilot to fly the pacemaker. In her book, she mentions how uh, Amelia was really kind of unable to keep the plane flying straight and level, you know, and. Uh, she may have had other reasons for saying things like that. Eleanor Smith got her pilot's license signed by Orville Wright when she was 16 and set world records for altitude and endurance while still in her teens. Voted the best female pilot in 1930. She was the first woman to appear on a Wheaties box. She was a test pilot for Blanca. Uh, she was born in 1911, and she died in 2010. And she did have a, a rather remarkable career. As a young girl, I mean, uh, before she was 20, she set these records that really were kind of uh, almost foolish. Uh, for instance, she flew under, on a dare, flew under all four bridges on the East River. In, uh, in New York, and uh, but anyway, she <laughs> she st and on her altitude test without uh, uh, altitude flight, uh, where she set a record without oxygen, she did pass out, but fortunately recovered uh, in time to to land. This is a senior skyrocket. Uh, this flew around the world in 1935. It had a very plush and comfortable interior 
like an expensive automobile. Uh, Wallace Beery, the movie actor, uh, was one of the people that owned one. I think this was about the time that automobiles wanted to look like airplanes. Airplanes wanted to have interiors like automobiles. Another plane is the air cruiser. This was built to carry 12 to 15 passengers, but in 1934, single engine planes could not be used as a commercial airliner. The air cruiser could, uh, could carry over 4,000 pounds, more than its empty weight. It was very successful as a cargo plane. Their ability to use pontoons, skis, or wheels allowed year round use up in Alaska. In Canada, Vermont. But the federal government felt you had to have at least two engines to be safe. Alaska always felt that you're better off with just one engine, which you know allowed you to carry a lot less fuel than a two or three engine thing. And if you notice or recall that all of the other planes were opting for the Orteg fly at the time, like Bird's airplane and uh, several others, they were three engine planes and none of them ever got off the ground. So Blanca was pretty right about that. This is the Irish Swoop. It was designed to enter the 1934 race from London to Australia. Uh, mechanical problems prevented it from competing but afterwards, it set a speed record across the Atlantic Ocean in 1936. This was the, the, the 28-90 Flash, an improved version of the Irish Swoop. About 42 were manufactured with uh, two fixed machine guns in the wing and a flexible machine gun in the rear cockpit and bomb racks. Some were shipped to China and some to Mexico. Uh, if you notice, these planes have Air France on it. None of them ever went to France. As a matter of fact, there's even some question as to where they did go. Uh, the, uh, our government at the time was reluctant to, to uh, or it was against the law, I guess, to, to sell military goods to a number of different countries. But somehow, they landed, uh, some of them landed in, in Japan and uh, and some actually got down to Mexico. As far as we know, none of them exist anymore. One thing that's interesting about this airplane and the Irish swoop, you can't quite see it here, is in order to support the wing, uh, they used cables, but they had a strut which extended down almost as far as the landing gear did. But with the landing gear retracted, you still had this strut uh, underneath, the, underneath the wing, which there's always the question, well, what do you do if you have to make a belly landing, you know? It was a fairly successful airplane. This is the only three-engine airplane that Belanca ever, ever made, um, called the Racer. Finished second in the Bendix cross-country race was stored at the Blanca airport and never raced again. And it may have been sold to uh, the Argentine government. I guess Frank Ianni's not here today, but uh, his story is that he had a ride in this airplane when he was just a child, and he had to kind of sit on the floor in front of the pilot. But he said that he, you know, he, he took a nice tour of, of Newcastle and uh, was impressed. This is the AT-21 called the Gunner. The Gunner was a bomber crew trainer designed by Lockheed. 39 were built by Belanca during World War II. Belanca also built gun turrets, pontoons, and other subcontract sub components during the war. <coughs> And during, during World War II, Blanca employed over 3,000 employees. This is the cruise air. After the war, Blanca resumed production of an improved version of the cruise air. 
the aviation industry expected to post to expect a post-war boom in private aviation, but this did not occur. Uh, and also, surplus military aircraft were available for virtually nothing. Over 800 crusaders were manufactured after World War II. Sales did not keep up with production, so massive layoffs at the Blanca factory followed. A union was organized, which also created some problems. Blanca saw the handwriting on the wall and sold his company to Northern Aircraft Company in 1954. The plant and land was sold October 25th, 1956, to Piasaki Helicopter Company, uh, now known as Bertol. GM, Blanca primarily liked to be called GM. And his son, Augie, designed the Skyrocket II, which was completed in 1973. This was made of composite material, uh, primary aluminum honeycomb and fiberglass. Uh, by using this material, he was able to get an extremely smooth uh, surface on the airplane without any bumps or rivets or whatever, which allowed him to design his wing uh, with what they call a, a, a lambda flow wing design. Uh, which uh, cuts down on drag and improves lift. And as a result, uh, he was able to set new records for speed and efficiency. Some of the records still, still stand. Augie, Augie could not raise enough funds to get it certified for manufacturing. And uh, he, he tried to sell them as kits for a while. I don't know if any actually sold. But the actual airplane, the uh, <coughs> me. the the actual Skyrocket II is right now in a hangar down at Georgetown Airport in Delaware, uh, and uh, the Balanca family uh, have had it stored for a number of years. It's it's no longer flyable, but it is complete. And uh, they, they offered the airplane to us for our museum. Unfortunately, we've never figured out how to bring it up here. Uh, it has a wingspan of like 35 feet. And in order to remove the wings, you'd actually have to cut them off. And the idea of just destroying the, the, the uh, finish there and cutting off the wings was just uh, not acceptable. So right now it is down there in Georgetown. Uh, the, the, uh, been a, there's a small museum down there and uh, he has it in a hangar. He's not too happy about paying the hangar rent for it but uh, he is so far. We still have the opportunity to bring it up to our place if we ever figure out how to do it. And there has been some, well, I guess speculation that uh, the fact that they are doing some heavy lift helicopter training down there at Georgetown, that it would make a nice uh, mission task just hauling up to, to our hospital. Anyway, we're not losing sleep over it. Blanca Aviation production tooling was moved to Minnesota <coughs> and the cruise air design was upgraded to produce the Blanca Viking, which is still in production. We still make a few of these a year. It's a very nice airplane. We have a, uh, one of them in our hangar, as a matter of fact. The original air service hangar burned down in 1934. A new hangar was built next to it. This is the new hangar being built. And note, note the curved roof and fan truss beams supporting it. This is classic construction of hangars from the 30s. And that's one of the reasons why we are on the uh, National Register of, of Historic Buildings, because of that construction. And uh, all the wood in those trusses 
uh, is in perfect shape. So we're, we're very, very proud of that feature. The new uh, 1935 air service hangar was larger and had many windows to take advantage of natural lighting. Air service provided fuel and repair, service rented aircraft, gave flying lessons, <coughs> and provided charter flights. John McChesney Morgan, known to all as Johnny Mac, and his brother Dick ran an air service until it closed and was sold in 1960. It's a very sad picture. From 1960 to 1998, the hangar was used by various non-aviation related businesses. And from 1998 to 2002, stood empty. Plans were underway to demolish the building when Jan Churchill wrote a letter to the trustees pointing out the historic significance of the hangar and urging them to consider its preservation. Thanks, Jan. <laughs> <laughs> the Friends of Balaka Airfield were formed and grants were obtained from Del Dot, the Federal Save American Treasures, and others. And this is just a, a uh, timeline of the hangar history. Built in 1928. Anyway, in 2006, by the trustees of the Newcastle Common and the Friends of Blanca agreed on a, on a, on a lease. And uh, since then, why uh, Friends of Blanca have been maintaining the, the hangar and improving it. Major improvements were made, including a new roof, rebuilding the attached annexes, as well as the interior museum structures. Work continues as funds and volunteers are available. We all need volunteers. We have a nice park, uh, parking lot there too. The hangar is the home of the uh, Delaware Aviation Hall of Fame, which celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. And during that 20, 20 years, why 121 persons have been inducted into the Hall of Fame. The Delaware Large Scale Model Training Club has set up a working display, uh, which, which is very popular with young visitors. And uh, we are always happy to see youngsters come in there. There's always a hope that they will volunteer someday. The, uh, the Blanca exhibits in the hangar include four Blanca aircraft a replica of Blanca's 1913 parasol plane, a flight simulator, and other artifacts, videos, pictures, and posters. One, one item is uh, this ashtray, aluminum ashtray. And actually, we have two of them. We know a third one that's in the Smithsonian. But this is made from the fuel tank of the Columbia. Columbia is the one, of course, the United uh, on the plane that Lindbergh is on it. And uh, I'll just pass it to her. <coughs> Each year, several car shows are hosted, and such as those by the Delaware Street Rides, the British Car Club, and the Antique Truck Club. And uh, we expect they will be exhibiting again this year. And it's nice to have them because while they're there, they visit our museum. <clears throat> Between 1928 and 1954, Balaka Aircraft Company produced over 3,000 aircraft of various types. In 2019, last July, Governor John Carney signed a bill designating the Balaka Cruise Air the official state of Delaware historic airplane. And we're pleased with that. But we have, of course, a, uh, one of the cruise airs on display. The cruise air that we have, uh, we, we got from the Smithsonian uh, Aerospace Museum in Washington. They had it for about 15 years. It was given to them. 
But they finally decided that they, since they had the CF Polanka on display, they felt that they would never do the restoration needed to put this plane on display. So we were fortunate to, to get it from them. And as I say, it's it, it, it probably, once again, never fly again. That's not our intent. But uh, we will preserve it as the <coughs> official state of Delaware historic airplane. Final word here. Like most every nonprofit organization, we rely on volunteers and encourage all of you to visit our museum when we open this springtime. Uh, are, there, are there any questions? What are your hours at the museum? All right, we're, we are open uh, probably from April through October on the second and fourth Saturday uh, of the month from uh, 11 to 3. We are, uh, well, we're, we're hoping, actually, if we, if we get more volunteers, we'll probably be open more often. And if indeed we are able to get heat in the hangar, which we are looking into, why we can probably stay up longer. Any other? Yeah. How did you get the cruise air from Washington up to blank up in Kessel? Uh, well, originally the when when the Smithsonian uh, obtained the 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 airplane. It was in Texas, and they intended to fly it up to the Washington area. Unfortunately, <laughs> a storm came through, a hailstorm, which uh, didn't do any structural damage, but it did uh, on some of the fabric part of it, it caused bumps and cracks. So instead, they, they uh, boxed it up in a, in a nice big crate and shipped it up. And they had it stored in this crate for a good 10 or 15 years. And so we just uh, got a car uh, hauler to haul it on this flat, flat bed and put it up, put it in the hangar and, and, and put it out of the box. Unfortunately, we can't do that with the plane that's down in Georgetown. It was too big. Anything else? Yes. Did, did you say how old Mr. Belanco was when he died and when did he die? Okay. Yes. Uh, he died in 1960. And he was born in, uh, let's say, uh, 1896. So, so he was born. fairly young, yeah. Died of leukemia. Is his son still around? His son, Augie, died just about three years ago. Did he live here in this area? Uh, Jane, do you know where Augie lived? Yeah, they had a home in Maryland. I used to visit there on the Sassafras River. And we'd sit down and talk about aviation in the good old days. So I knew both of them. There are still a lot of uh, cruise airs uh, flying at this airplane. And uh, the people that still fly them, uh, they love them. Uh, we had, and we, we, get, uh, we get requests in now, and now and again of people that had them. Uh, usually, usually what they have is a, a damaged one. But offering them to us, we're, uh, as a matter of fact, just about a week or two, had a call from a fellow that had a very early version of the cruise air called the Junior, and uh, that he was restoring, but he had a fire, which damaged one of the wings quite severely. But he wanted to know whether we wanted it, and uh, we sadly had to decline to number of reasons. Anyway, any, anything else? Yeah. Back in the early days, how many hours did it take to fly across the pond to Europe? Uh, 
I think Lindbergh did it in something like 35 hours. 35. Yeah. So the Columbia, the Blanc airplane, had already uh, flown 51 hours nonstop just circling around the airport up on Long Island. So there's no question in the minds of Blanca and his partner Levine that they could fly across it and carry enough fuel and so on. And it was a very reliable airplane. And actually the story about Blanca's partner, Charles Levine, is really quite a very interesting story in its own right. The fellow Levine made millions after World War One selling uh, brass uh, cartridge cases back to the government. And uh, he was interested in aviation, and Polanka kind of got in bed with him and just set up the, uh, the Columbia Aircraft Company. But uh, Levine's actions were so weird, especially he was responsible for the Columbia not being able to fly across the ocean. And Columbia could have flown across weeks before Lindbergh. But he, he had these arguments with the potential pilots. And he felt, first of all, he felt that uh, the pilot he wanted had to be photogenic. In other words, there's going to be a lot of publicity about this. You know? so he, uh, one of the pilots, the co-pilot, he felt was overweight. And he had had a contract with them, and at the last minute he cancels the contract, and that's of course a problem because his co-pilot then gets a court injunction. You know, eventually uh, Levine loses all his money. He ends up destitute after spending several terms, a uh, year or two terms in prison for various dishonest business practices. So uh, immediately after Lindbergh's flight, however, Malacca was so upset with this partnership with Levine that he quit the company, Columbia Aircraft Company. Uh, he wrote a letter to Levine just saying that he just you know, can't stand by, work for a company that worked with him. So he quit, and of course, this was the same time they end up coming down to the Delaware. But uh, Levine's a very interesting mm -hmm. person. I, I seem to recall hearing that uh, Amelia Earhart was interested in a Belanca plane mm -hmm. for her flight. Is that true? Or? Well, not for any particular flight that we know of. She was interested, and I don't know the, the details, all I know is really what uh, Eleanor Smith kind of says in her book. And uh, uh, Amelia visited uh, a Blanca factory, and thanks to Dick, we have her autograph on a, on a, on a picture down there. And uh, uh, Eleanor took her for several flights uh, to let her handle the controls. It's possible that she is in the market for it, or maybe she just wanted to, you know, to, to test fly it. But uh, Eleanor, when they landed, she told the uh, GM that. Uh, that he shouldn't sell her one because uh, he didn't feel that she was able to handle it very well. But, uh, I don't know. No. Was Belanca used for any kind of civil defense operations during World War II? Uh, other than the, well, other than the, that uh, bomber, they, they made this bomber trainer. Uh, the government figured that it's a lot cheaper to train a bomber pilot and gunners in a two-engine plane and a four-engine plane. Yeah. So that's the only real military aircraft that they were involved in. Uh, they did, uh, I know they, they did uh, oppose a proposal to build a trainer plane very similar to the Fairchild PT-19, but they uh, didn't get the contract. But they did build uh, lots of turrets and other uh, parts of airplanes, you know, ailerons, and so on. But they, but they had these, like, 3,000 employees. And it's not unusual 
for somebody to visit our museum and say that, oh, my mother worked there during the war. And uh, it's very interesting meeting these people. Okay, yeah. Yes. Are you going to consider air conditioning as well? Yes. Okay. Very extensive <laughs> process. Uh, how practical it is considering the uh, traffic that we get right. still has to be decided. But uh, we are not going to start until we get the funds. <laughs> Although uh, we may break it down into sections right. that, that we can handle. One, one other comment. Uh, the a Delaware Aviation Hall of Fame started in the year 2000. And I'd like to point out that Jan Churchill was in the first group of uh, fancy woman. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate you coming and talking to us.